Good afternoon. My name is Monique LaRock, and I would like to thank you for joining the webinar today, Accelerating Innovation, Funding for Women Entrepreneurs in Biotechnology and Healthcare. A few short, quick announcements. We will be taking questions throughout and monitoring them, and you can use the chat feature on the right of the webinar on your screen to send questions to the organizers and we will be responding to them during the Q&A period. There is closed captioning available, and if you need technical assistance at any time, you can call 1-855-352-9002. Please note at the conclusion of the webinar, we have an evaluation and feedback. We value your, your insights, your perspectives, and your questions. Please do stick around for that evaluation. To go through the agenda today, we will uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, we will have a short session on the landscape of women in science and biotech, and then we'll get into the meat of our discussion, helping to provide a detailed overview of the SBAR and SETR programs at NCATS, NHLBI, and NCI. We'll go through some quick tips and solutions to help you be successful, as well as technical assistance program followed by a moderated Q&A session. On behalf of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, I'd like to thank all of you for attending, as well as our collaborators, including the Association for Women in Science, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, NHLBI, the National Cancer Institute, NCI, as well as the Coalition of State Bioscience Institutes. What we hope to accomplish today, we hope that following this session, you'll have an increased understanding about the funding opportunities that are available for women entrepreneurs and researchers. We wanna really offer support to you and respond to your questions, and then offer post-webinar support as well to applicants from women-owned businesses and in general, want to start a dialogue with you so that we can engage on interesting projects and ideas. To introduce our speakers for today, you'll be hearing from Heather Metcalf from AWIS, Lily Portilla from NCAT, Chris Asiella from NHLBI, and Corey Hallett from NCI. And with that, I turn it over to Heather. Hi hey everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as the Director for Research and Analysis with the Association for Women in Science, um, I'd like to first start off by addressing some of the challenges that we've found in the research surrounding gender, science and biotech, and innovation, entrepreneurship, and science commercialization. Then I'll talk about the wealth of resources available to address some of those challenges. So what are the challenges in this space? Um, the research shows stark gender differences in financial resource acquisition for entrepreneurship, particularly with regard to obtaining early stage financing and startup capital. Research conducted by the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy shows that women are significantly less likely than men to start or acquire firms with business loans from banks or financial institutions and are less likely to receive venture capital. Research shows similar patterns in angel investments as well. Um, investment competition and experimental research at Harvard and MIT has also demonstrated that when the same pitch content is presented to potential investors, men are more than twice as likely to have their entrepreneurial pitches funded than women. As a result, women start firms with less capital than men. According to the Kaufman Firm survey, between 2004 and 2008, 61.8% of women started firms with less than $25,000 compared to 55.9% of men. The survey research also shows that firms that started with more than $125,000 in capital um, performed significantly better than the lower capital startups in assets, revenue, and employment. Our AWIS research shows similar disparities in company leadership positions as well. 
in 2015, among the 73 biotech companies that made their initial public offerings, only five had women CEOs, and 21% had no women in any leadership position whatsoever. This is both a social justice issue and a financial issue. Research has demonstrated specific benefits to those companies with women among their leadership. Those companies that have at least three women among their directorship have seen significant gains in return on investing capital, return on sales, and return on equity, especially if women's involvement in directorships is sustained for four out of five years. Those companies with at least one woman director experience greater long-term stockholder value as well. Um, one way to address these gaps is to provide women entrepreneurs, business owners, and innovators with the necessary knowledge to strengthen their applications for capital. SDIR grant funding can be one such source of capital, as we'll find out more about today. Um, it funds small innovative firms with pre-prototype technologies during the phase of funding that our research has shown to be the most difficult to obtain, particularly for women. Um, we still see gaps in SDIR awards to women. For instance, reports from the Small Business Administration and the National Academies of Science show that women-owned firms receive about 12% of Phase I awards and 11% of Phase II awards. At the NIH, we're seeing awards to women-owned businesses increasing, and we hope to see this pattern continue in federal funding, particularly as efforts to increase the transparency and equity of application and award processes are made. Um, additionally, there are many opportunities available to strengthen applications, including help from the experts on these issues. So the webinar that you're all participating in today is a great example of this and has been put together through the collaborative effort of experts that were mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, including the Association for Women in Science, NCAT, NHLBI, and NCI. The Association for Women in Science offers a number of additional research-driven research programs and initiatives at the individual and organizational levels. As you'll be hearing shortly from our other speakers, NCAT and NHLBI and NCI have several grant resources that are available um, and are specific to small businesses and SDIRS TTR funding. The Small Business Administration and National Women's Business Council offer many opportunities as well um, for those who wish to engage in innovative and entrepreneurial activities. Uh, and they have particular research and programs that focus on women, minority, and immigrant entrepreneurs. And they have a webinar that's coming out on Monday on the tipping point for women's entrepreneurship. Your STEM disciplinary and professional societies also often host their own initiatives aimed at science and engineering commercialization. Many offices on university campuses have been established for these purposes, including tech transfer office offices and research and development offices. There are a number of organizations that are aware of these equity issues that I mentioned earlier and that focus on helping businesses and innovators ob obtain funding, angel investments, and venture capital. Many of these are local, so if you take a look around your local area, you, you may see a lot of um, that's available there. A few examples of these organizations include Golden Seeds, Springboard, QB3, Hastia, Startup in a Box, Lean Launchpad, Activate, 1776, and Parents Holding Doctorates. Funding agencies, and particularly your program officers within those funding agencies, are key resources in proposal development. Program officers really want to hear from and support investigators prior to seeing a grant submission cross their desks. Um, however, they're an often underutilized resource. So a forming a key relationship with your program officer can really strengthen your proposal. There are a number of innovative and um, entrepreneurship programs that are available as well. Sorry, the slide skipped. Thank you. Um, at AWIS, we're about to host our third national summit on innovation and entrepreneurship, which takes place in Chicago on March 31st. And it has a focus on the health and medical sciences. It brings together innovators and entrepreneurs with equity-minded policymakers, governmental agencies, academics, funders, and company leaders, um, and provides a wealth of information to attendees and speakers. For more information about our summit, you can go to innovation-summit.org. 
Other programs include the Kauffman Foundation Fast Track Venture Program, the White House uh, Inclusive Entrepreneurship Program and Demo Day, and the NCATS and NHLBI Technical Assistance Programs, which will be discussed shortly. Another valuable opportunity lies in your mentoring network. Broadening that network to specifically include mentors who will serve as your sponsor, who have knowledge, like business knowledge, that you might not have, who have experience, for example, other women entrepreneurs who have successfully started their own companies um, and have experiences that connect to yours, um, and also those who have successfully been funded. These mentors should, can, can share a wealth of information with you about what to expect, how and where to seek funding, and how you can handle any roadblocks that you might encounter along the way. Lastly, if your proposal is rejected, consider the reviewer's feedback, revise, and try again. Research illustrates that men are more likely than women to resubmit after a rejection. Making use of your program officer and, re and reviewer comments can significantly help strengthen your proposal and increase its chances of success the next time around. So don't give up if, you, if you're first um, rejected. Thank you. Hi, this is um, Lily Portia, and I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon to our webinar. Um, I'm a Director of Strategic Alliances here at NCATS and also the um, SBIR Program Manager for the, um, for the Center. Um, so what are the SBIR and STTR programs? Um, well, the main purpose of them is to help entrepreneurial research as they launch businesses um, and engage in R&D to seek to find a way of commercializing new products, um, and at least from the NIH perspective, that if they have public benefits. SBIR um, supports early stage research and development uh, projects at small businesses, while the STTR program um, helps small businesses that are, uh, allow them to formally collaborate with research institutions in both phase one and phase two of, uh, of the SBIR grant. So what are the Excuse me. What are the benefits of the SBIR and STTR uh, uh, program? Um, so it is one of the largest funding sources of early stage life sciences in the country, and, and, and I'll show you some figures relating to um, NIH in a few minutes. It, it's stable and predictable. It's a set aside program which is mandated by Congress that of uh, funding agencies such as the um, NIH and our sister organizations like CDC and FDA. A set aside money for this program. IP rights are not are uh, held by the small business, um, not by the funding agency. It's not a loan, um, non dilutive capital. Um, and one of the big pluses that, at least from our perspective, that we feel is that these projects go through in a rigorous uh, peer review system here at NIH, which allows the award allows the awardee to leverage. Um, that review and that validation of their technology to attract additional funding and other strategic partnerships. Um, so if you look across, um, this was something that was um, mandated, again, I said by Congress, and there was a recent reauthorization of the program, and during that reauthorization, it, uh, it the uh, set aside for SBIR and STTR were um, were increased and um, on a yearly basis starting from October 2013 to, um, to 2017 and currently in 2016 you can see here what the set aside is for SBIR versus STTR. So here at the NIH our, um, our budget uh, overall budget across all of the 27 centers and institutes that exist here at the NIH is, is about $31 billion. Um, if you, uh, what's a set aside for the SBIR program is now approximately about $800 million, and that is as a result of uh, our increase in the budget that we had here at the NIH. So you're talking about a significant amount of funding um, that's set aside for this program. So there are uh, budget hard caps that exist for the program, and when I speak of a phase one versus a phase two, it's not what um, FDA considers to be a phase one or phase two grant. That's just the name of the program and uh, of these various stages of the program, and I'll 
get into a little bit more detail as to what those entail in a few minutes. But the award guidelines here at NIH are 150 uh, for the phase one, 150,000 for the phase one, and up uh, up to a million for the phase two. However, we do have these hard caps. Even though I talked about these award guidelines, you can go up higher, but no higher than 225,000 for a phase one and 1.5 um, a million for a phase two. All of this is described in the notice that we have here at the, at the bottom of this slide that goes into detail as to uh, what the differences are between these award guidelines versus the award hard caps. But just know that uh, the award hard caps stay at about 225 for the phase one. So having said that, um, there are um, some additional things to consider. Excuse me. Um, there are um, some topics that the NIH funds that do allow them to go past that 225,000 uh, hard cap that I mentioned. Those topics are listed as part of the omnibus solicitation, and if you go to the Appendix A of the Program and Description Guide that's in that funding announcement, you will be able to see what topics um, the NIH has uh, the uh, authority to go past these hard caps of 225. And for each of the institutes participating, they have various topics and various funding limits. So it's best to read uh, what those funding limits are based on what institute you intend to apply to. So regarding the funding overview, I, I want to I'm going to talk about the omnibus solicitation, which, um, as you can see here, are, are I'm going to call them investigator-initiated grant funding pro, uh, uh, funding under the specific, specific program. Um, it has these deadlines of April 5th, uh, September 5th, and January 5th. I'm going to talk about the direct to phase two grant program under the SBIR. Um, and also, uh, there are targeted solicitations that va uh, various institutes across the NIH have that uh, some of the ICs, in institutes and centers have identified as top priority areas, so there may be specific solicitations around certain topics. And then, once a year at the NIH, some of the institutes participate in what's called the SBIR contract solicitation, which are not grants, but contracts that are funded under the SBIR program. And that is once a year, and usually those solicitations are um, uh, made available to the public uh, end of September, beginning of October. So let's talk about what the SBIR STTR program looks like. So uh, again, when we talk about a phase one, we're in SBIR, we're talking about that discovery stage, primarily feasibility studies that are done um, to uh, help move a technology, uh, you know, some development of a technology. The phase two part of the program is, um, you know, a full R&D uh, type of proposal. And phase three is commercialization, hopefully, and that's when you are partnering up with another um, with, you know, having a strategic partnership, some uh, venture capital funding, but the, but the primary part of what NIH funds under this uh, program are the phase one and phase two um, grants. So a fast track opportunity, when we talk about fast track here at, at, at the NIH, we're talking about um, proposals that um, uh, are submitted that not only cover what uh, projects under a phase one part of the grant, but also a phase two. So you're getting a commitment. So long as you meet your milestones in your project plan that you put together, you're getting a commitment for phase one funding as well as the phase two funding. And not all um, um, institutes have a fast track um, program, so it's good to check and see who you're applying to. Um, and this only applies to SBIR, um, the SBIR part of the program, not um, STTR. The other program that we fund is the direct to phase two. So this, this would be a situation where you have um, enough data 
and information that you would have gotten in a phase one grant and you have all that information, you would have completed those um, studies under non-SBIRS PTR funds. And then what it allows you to do is to skip that phase one and go directly to the phase two, which um, that's where the name is derived. And so you can, um, um, it, it allows you to go directly again to the phase two. So that is a special solicitation that's listed here. That's PAR 14088 and um, PAR 15288. And be aware that not all institutes participate in the program. So again, depending on what your project looks like and the area, um, it's best to always check with that respective institute or center to get a sense of whether they would they participate in the program. And of course, in the funding announcement, you would be able to see that as well too. So regarding what is the definition of what a woman-owned small business is, it's a firm that must be at least 51% owned and controlled by one or more women and is primarily managed by one or more women who, um, must, who must be U.S. citizens. The firm um, must be small in its primary industry in accordance to SBA size standards, so um, you can also go to the SBA website to get some information on, that, on this, but for NIH purposes, the small business concern that is um, woman owned needs to self certify this on the SF424 form uh, for your application. So, who is eligible? So, what is the eligibility for the SBIR funding? Um, its criteria for applying for an SBIR is that um, U.S. businesses with 500 or fewer employees. The PI's primary employment must be with the small business concern at the time of the award and during the duration of the project. Uh, more than 50% must be U.S. owned by individuals or independently operated. And a new uh, change that a program that happened a few years ago was allowing um, some of the company to be owned uh, or backed by uh, venture capital funding or private equity firms and hedge firms. So that's, that's a change for the program in terms of eligibility. For STTR, um, slightly different. Um, you have to have an established cooperative research and development effort between um, a, the small business as well as a research institution. 40% um, of the work uh, can be done uh, by the small business concern and a, mi a, a minimum of 40 percent, excuse me, and a minimum of 30 percent needs to be done by the U.S. college, university, or research institution. There needs to be a formalized intellectual property agreement between the university and the uh, small business concern in the event, this, this would uh, come into play when the university is allowing the small business to um, use the technology they have either through a license or some option agreement, but if, if that's the intent to use um, some proprietary technology that the university has funded and um, has in it and owns, then there must be this formalized intellectual property agreement. And for NIH purposes, we don't need to see the agreement, we just need to know that it exists and that you have the freedom to operate to use the technology. And the primary employment of the principal, principal investigator can be either with the small business concern or the research institution. So again, key differences between SBIR and STTR. Uh, SBIR permits a research and, uh, institution partners. You could be co-PIs um, on, 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 on a particular grant. And the small business concern may outsource um, uh, up, up to um, approximately 33% of the phase one activities and about 50% of the phase two act activities. STTR requires the research institution, it, it, it requires that you have a research institution partner such as a university or college and a minimum of 40% of the work should be conducted by the small business concern um, and a minimum of 30% it should be conducted by the nonprofit research institution. And in both instances, the awards are always made to the small business concern. 
And for, uh, again, what is a socially, we wanted to touch on this as well too, what is a socially and economically disadvantaged business and the firm must be 51% owned and controlled by one or more disadvantaged persons. Disadvantaged persons or persons must be socially disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged. And the firm must be small according to SBI or SBA uh, size standards. And again, um, you would need to self-certify this at the time of registering your business in the um, one of the systems that NIH uses, the system of award management, the SAM system. So I'm going to briefly go and, and tell you a little bit about some uh, funding opportunities and topics of interest that some of our participants in this webinar today, NHLBI and NCI, are funding. I had mentioned this previously that um, of the majority of the grant applications that NIH receives, um, as well as our sister agencies, the CDC and the FDA, um, receive it through this omnibus solicitation that comes out once a year. It gets updated once a year. These are the two current versions that are here, the PA15269 and PA15270. Um, this is a very um, a comprehensive document that lists every topic of interest across the NIH. And the, the, this program description document and research topic document that's part of that FOA is really, the, the I think, again, a key uh, thing to read and understand and familiarize yourself because much of, many of the grant budget guidelines are listed in that document as well as the topics that each one of a the institutes here at NIH fund, funds. The uh, awards, uh, excuse me, applications are due January 5th, April 5th, and September 5th of every year. I'm not going to go through these in great detail. I understand that we will be making this um, presentation available to, to everyone, but um, I'm going to speak specifically about NCAT's topics of interest. Um, we have a, a large focus on drug discovery and development tools. Here is a small um, um, uh, uh, sampling of what we're looking for, the types of topics. I always encourage our um, folks that come to us to have a discussion with me or one of my colleagues to make sure that what you're proposing really does fit within the NCATS mission. And I would venture to say that the other uh, participants, NHLBI and NCI also like to uh, talk to uh, grantees prior to submission to get, make sure that their topics also fall that within their uh, their top, you know their interests and, and and priorities. For NCATS, we also have a, um, uh, some interest in diagnostics and devices. While though not as rich as some of the other institutes here at at, at, at um, NIH, we we do look at them. We also have a strong focus around bioinformatic and information technology tools tools that allow for a lot of sharing of research information, um, a clinical research management tools as well that aid in patient recruitment, IRB management, um, and um, uh, platforms that allow uh, for registries and, multi and natural history studies. If you go to our website, you would really get a great um, um, idea of what we're looking for. We also do fund some special topics, and I talked about these early, uh, early in, the, in the presentation about focused um, topics uh, that come under specific grant solicitations. We have one that is uh, looking for platform delivery technologies for nucleic acid therapeutics. We're also participating with um, other organizations, other institutes here at NIH on bioreactors for reparative medicine. Um, and um, development of appropriate pediatric formulations and drug delivery systems. Here are, uh, here's a sampling of NHLBI's topics of interest. As you can see here, they have more of this heart, lung, blood focus. And um, you can go to their website to learn more about what exactly they are funding to. And of course, talking to their um, um, the folks in the um, um, SBIR program office. And uh, NCI's um, um, portfolio areas are covered here. As you can see, much more focus on oncology, therapeutics, um, devices, um, 
imaging, um, a lot of, uh, and also digital health. And, and I, again, best, best advice I could give is to talk to the respective um, institute that you intend to apply to. Some more. Okay, so let's talk really briefly about what the review criteria are for SBIRS TTR grants. Um, so, what it, what comprises your overall impact score? Um, so, there's um, review criteria around the significance of of your what you're proposing, what the what the real problem, the real problem that you're trying to solve, as well as the commercial potential of what you are proposing is going to fix this problem. Who your investigative team is? What uh, do you have the right expertise? Um, um, are they known out in the field? Are, have you partnered with the right people to bring this technology to commercialization? The innovative, uh, also the innovation, making sure is this in a, a brand new space that you're proposing, or is it an improvement upon something uh, sta a current standard of care that currently exists? what your approach is around the research design and the feasibility of what your, what your approach is as well too, and also what your facilities and resources that you're gonna be using to get the work done. An additional review criteria, although it's not scored individually, it does get discussed in, in review. It's the uh, protection of human subjects issue, inclusion of women, minorities, and children in the event you're doing um, some kind of clinical study. Um, anim, uh, vertebrae animals, and of course, uh, use of any biohazard materials also discussed in, in review. So here are, um, again, these are the deadlines for, for most of these applications that come in on, uh, for the omnibus and, and as well as some other um, specific funding announcements that NIH has. So for instance, if you were to submit, um, our upcoming deadline is April 5th. If you submit on April 5th, you could expect the scientific uh, peer review to happen between the June and July time period. These would go to September, uh, December, um, excuse me, August or September Council for review. And the earliest award date could happen anywhere between, um, I would say, um, uh, between September and December. This is all dependent on what that specific institute how they manage their program. And again, another good question to ask your, your program officer. I wouldn't, I don't think the SBIR program is a good program if you intend, if you need funding immediately because of the timelines associated with it, but it's best to have that discussion with your specific program officer to learn how this, how that particular institute would go about, what their timelines for funding are but it's not something that is, um, you know, we're not talking about a couple of months here. It's more time between the time you submit a, a, a grant application to the time that it gets awarded. So here's some tips and tools for successful applications. Um, um, please, please review carefully the funding opportunity announcements. Um, understand what the el eligibility are for each one of these. There might be some specific uh, focus that they want you to pay attention in your application. Um, I, again, I, I, I know that here at MCAT we encourage applicants to contact us prior to submitting to us just to make sure, again, that you're submitting your application to the right place, that we are the best fit for that. And I, again, I, I think the other folks participating on this uh, uh, webinar from representing NCI and NHLBI I would also um, uh, advise you to do the same thing too. If you go to this link here, you can get an idea, you can get the contact for all the folks that are managing the program here at across the NIH. Um, my other piece of advice is to register early for the SBIR and STTR electronic submission process. There's four or five different systems that you need to register for. And these take time. They, you know, some of them can take up to four weeks to completely register in. So allow yourself enough time to make that happen because um, it would, um, it's so disappointing when I hear a grantee tell me that they don't have the registrations, but, but their grant application got rejected because of these registrations not being, uh, 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 you know, uh, completely done. Give yourself enough time to submit a good application. 
Um, and, and also there's a new service that the NIH has, which is called NIH Assist, which is to streamline the application process. And uh, for instance, it, 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 it delegates application preparation responsibility to multiple users. And you know, if you have multiple users within your company, this is a way to do that. It runs validations on federal wide and agency business rules. Um, it's, a, it's a new service, and um, you can register for that as well, too, when you submit your, your application. Um, so these were the, uh, here is, uh, all these applications must be submitted, submitted electronically. And when I talked about these five registrations, here they are. And uh, again, allow yourself plenty of time to get these done so that you can submit your application and not have these things um, hang you up or, or cause an error in your submission. Um, I think these are a few of the common application problems that we hear from review. Um, reviewers may think that some, the, what you're proposing has no significance, right? It's like not a, um, there's, it's not a convincing case for commercial potential or societal impact for what you're trying to solve. Um, inadequately defined a testing of a test of the feasibility of whatever you're uh, proposing in the application, lack of innovation, um, also um, uh, maybe a, a very unfocused research plan or one that is so broad in scope that the budget, you know, that's another thing too. You want your um, uh, application, um, your research plan to match the budget that you're proposing. Proposing a lot of things that a budget can't cover or not going to, that's not going to do well in review. Also, the lack of experience with essential methodologies in terms of what you're proposing, um, being unfamiliar with relevant published work in that particular space that you're proposing, and as I mentioned earlier, unrealistic large amounts of work that you're proposing to do in the grant and that just cannot be accomplished with the budget that's being proposed. So it, important facts to remember, eligibility is determined at the time of award, not at the time of submission of the grant. Um, the, the PI um, is not required to have a PhD or MD, however, if you um, intend on doing uh, clinical, um, uh, doing some kind of clinical work under your SBIR or STTR, you've got to have the right personnel. So we want to make sure that the, you've assembled the right team to move the project forward. Also, um, uh, it, it, the PI is required to have expertise to oversee the project scientifically and technically. Um, applications can be submitted to different agencies uh, funding agencies for similar work uh, um, to support different aims and objectives. There, however, there cannot be overlap, and eventually that will be sorted out. We, we, uh, we, do, eventually, we do catch that sometimes we see duplication between funding agencies. And awards may not be accepted from different agencies for duplicative projects. I just said that. Okay, um, very quickly, I'm going to talk about these two um, Small business resources here that um, NCATS funds. The first one is uh, Bridging. This is not an SBIR STTR program. It is called uh, Bridges, and it's a collaboration between our intramural lab here and um, small businesses and academics as well. And you enter your project when you have a clinical candidate identified, any diseases eligible. Um, the folks at Bridges do a gap analysis to find out what key studies need to be done in order to get you to exit at or before an IND. Um, it's a milestone-driven program, and we accept all sorts of therapeutic modalities under this specific program, small molecule peptide, gene therapy, antibody, you name it. Um, eligible applicants are um, academics um, uh, here in the U.S. as well as out, and also uh, SBIR-eligible businesses. The other uh, de-risking program that we have is TREND, Therapeutics for Rare Neglected Diseases. Runs very similar to the Bridges program, except that the focus here has to be on rare and neglected diseases as identified and, uh, and meet the FDA orphan or, H, or WHO um, criteria. Again, mal, um, milestone driven. Um, we, take pro we can take projects past 
the IND stage up into uh, the maximum we would ever take anything is up to a phase 2A, but again, that's very dependent on each program that's brought to us and what brought to us and what uh, um, uh, what work needs to be done. And again, a broad range of therapeutic modalities that are um, accepted into the program. And we, our aim is to de-risk the technology so that the small business or the academic can develop a a strategic partnership, license the technology, or uh, whatever it is that they need to do to get it to the next stage for commercialization. And this is open to academics, uh, nonprofit government labs, small businesses. Um, in fact, 50% of our portfolio is with small businesses here. So I'm going to give control, I believe, to Hi, Lily. Thanks. Yes. So this is Chris Hassiella from the NHLBI, or the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And I work in the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. So this is the office at NHLBI that has a central team to help our small business applicants get connected to the Institute and learn about our funding and non-funding opportunities. So what I'm going to start with, since Lily just did a great job talking about the SBIR program, is I'm going to talk about general programs that are not necessarily FBIR focused. And the first of those is going to be talking about NIH's flagship early stage innovator support program, the NIH Centers for Accelerated Innovation, and the Research Evaluation and Commercialization Hubs. These programs provide proof of concept funding for innovations that are beyond the hypothesis driven research that normally occurs in academic institutions, but that really aren't quite yet ready to attract investments or score well in a business, uh, small business study section. So each center or hub is a partnership of one or more research institutions with private partners who have biomedical expertise and federal partners who have a role in the U.S. development of biomedical technologies. And the partners are all listed here on this slide. The two programs are really quite similar with the exception of their mission space. The Centers Program was started in 2013 by the NHLBI and has been joined by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So innovations that are fostered by the Centers Program fall within the mission of these two institutes. However, the uh, REACH Program is funded centrally by NIH and is therefore open to all biomedical technologies in any field. So how do the centers and hubs work? Well, what happens is that the uh, member institutions solicit technologies from investigators within their network, and then they evaluate the project feasibility using internal, external, and federal review feedback cycles. Once a project is selected, both the project and the team are enabled in the development of the technology by access to funding, education, project management, and technology development expertise and experience. And all that helps the innovators understand how to set and reach milestones and develop a product development plan. Projects may remain in either the Centers or Hub program for between six to 24 months, depending on the technology and the amount of work needed. And upon exit, it's expected that they're gonna have a clear value proposition that they can explain. A product development plan that includes regulatory reimbursement and intellectual property considerations, and that therefore they're gonna be well positioned to attract additional support whether from a private investor, a granting agency, or by licensing the technology to a strategic partner. And although we at NIH are very excited about the NCAI and REACH programs, the resources that they provide are really available only to investigators at one of the funded or partner institutions. So for investigators in the NHLBI uh, mission space, which covers heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders and diseases, we have a number of IND enabling programs. So for NHLBI, these programs are the Gene Therapy Resource Program, the Production Assistance for Cellular Therapies Program, and Science Moving Towards Research, Translation, and Therapy, which we cobbled into SMART as an acronym. Uh, these programs can provide eligible investigators with the manufacture of GMT material, preclinical testing, regulatory affairs support for the conduct of a pre-IND meeting or an IND filing, things of that nature. We also have a uh, program called BioLink, which is a clinical specimen and data repository. 
from which innovators can request resources, either data or specimens or both, to support the development of diagnostics for some of NHLDI's unique clinical population. All four of these resources are available to our community regardless of their current or prior NHLDI funding uh, and also free of charge to the uh, investigators. Uh, we also know that sometimes innovators just have a question and it's not about the science and they're just looking for someone who's knowledgeable and can give them a response that won't cost them an arm and a leg. So in NHLBI's Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination, we hope to fill those non-science knowledge gaps that our biomedical innovators face. We have four experienced professionals. I am a regulatory specialist. I started my career at FDA. I've worked for a contracting company for a number of years leading their regulatory affairs and services team, and now I've been with NIH for about four years. My colleague Gary Robinson has worked in a number of startup companies, has received an FBIR award from NIH, and has a lot of experience talking with investors and strategic partners to uh, you know, help build and sell that value proposition. But speaking of uh, investors, Steve Flame, who is our uh, investor in residence, has worked at major pharma companies in delivering uh, new technologies to the market. He's started several small companies as a serial entrepreneur, and he's also currently an angel investor. He's the former president of Tech Coast Angels, the largest angel group in the uh, Southern California region. And he is currently on the board of the American Capital Association. So he's very connected with the investor community and knows what they're looking for. He works with our companies to help them develop a strong pitch for their value proposition. If you're going to pitch your technology to a company, however, rather than to individual investors, you probably want to reach out to Ethel Rubin, our entrepreneur in residence. She has started multiple companies. She's been a scout for a major medical device company, and a great way of targeting in on the key questions that a strategic partner is going to want you to address in your presentation. To request time with any of us, please visit the link at the bottom of this slide. So in my office, we've noticed that we tend to get some of the same basic questions from multiple applicants over time. And so to address this specific set of knowledge gaps, we've developed a series of webinars that we call the NHLBI Small Biz Hangout. These are hour-long webinars. They target in on specific issues, such as how to develop a target product profile, write a commercialization plan, or understand the different types of intellectual property that you can wrap around your technology. Each hangout is recorded, captioned, and post it on the playlist listed up here at the top of the slide on the NHLDI YouTube channel. And here's a list of all of the events we've presented thus far. If you want to find out about upcoming events, such as the one that will be delivered next Tuesday on integrating your regulatory and research plans, please sign up for my office's email updates at the link shown on this slide. Of course, all of these in-kind and knowledge resources that I've just talked about are really great, but if you're a small business, what you really need is money to get the work done. So, NHLDI is the third largest institute at the NIH, and we have an annual budget of $3.1 billion. Some of that money goes on to support programs such as the NCAI program that I have mentioned, or GTRP, PAX and SMART, and BioLink, but 92 million dollars of that is dedicated just to support small business grants and contracts. So in addition to the complete description of phase one, phase two, fast track, direct to phase two uh, programs that Lily just described, NHLBI supports a phase two B program. This is a continuing award for someone who's successfully completed a phase two project. We don't participate in the NIH parent announcement, but we have one that we've developed just for ourselves, for our institute, and it's actually composed of two announcements. One for technologies that are targeting a rare disease or a pediatric indication, and we call that our small market award. And a second for technologies that address more traditional indications with larger markets, and we call that our bridge award. In both cases, the technology must require FDA clearance or approval for market entry in the U.S. The total award amount may not exceed $3 million over three years, and we require that you submit a fundraising plan, as, and that is actually part of the evaluation criteria for your award. 
So for the small market program, the fundraising plan should indicate that you're going to be able to, ra to uh, raise at least an additional one-third of the requested funding. So if you're asking for $3 million, you can submit a plan that has at least $1 million of planned fundraising. And that needs to be from non-federal sources. For the bridge award, our expectation is that applicants should be able to raise at least a full match for the requested funding, again, from non-federal sources. So at NIH, we often get asked, what are you interested in funding? And the real answer that we tell is, we're interested in funding whatever you're passionate about. But we also have some more directed programs where we think maybe there's not enough independent interest or we have a particular mission focus for our institute. So on this slide, as well as on the topics of special interest that Lily posted earlier, I've listed just a couple of examples of how we communicate what we're interested in. We may put out specific requests for applications and a funding opportunity. We post the topics of special interest on our website. And then once a year, we do have um, contract solicitations if there is a very specific need that we've identified that we feel we can stimulate through the SBIR mechanism. But we know we're not going to be able to fund your entire technology development effort by NIH dollars. So one of the things we do is we explore ways to help our awardees be successful after their NHLBI funding has run out. Toward that end, NHLBI has executed a series of semi-annual innovation conferences across the U.S pulling together investors and strategic partners who are active investors and partners in the heart, lung, blood, and sleep biomedical product development arenas. We invite our current and recent portfolio companies to present either orally or with a poster at these events, and this gives them the opportunity to interact with potential future funders, collaborators, or partners. This map shows a couple of the places that we've been and we'll be coming up to, we expect to be coming up to New York um, this fall in affiliation with some other conferences that are going on. Please sign up for our listserv to find out more about that. Um, but we know that we can't possibly bring everyone into one room at one time and facilitate all of the connections that might be needed. So we are also in collaboration with our sister institutes and centers here at the NIH, developing relationships with a number of investor and professional society meetings, as indicated on this slide to allow some of our companies to present their technologies in front of these wider audiences. And we hope that the connections that our companies make at these events will lead to relationships that will drive their technologies towards the U.S. healthcare market. Um, at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Corey Hallett, who will tell you about the NCI, NCI resources and programs. Thank you. Hi. Um Everyone, so in the interest of time, I'm probably going to uh, cut this fairly short, but the slide should be available to you afterward. Um, so <clears throat> I'm Corey Hallett. I'm at the National Cancer Institute, and I um, today I'm just going to briefly mention some of the technolo technology assistance and training programs open to SBIR and STTR funded small businesses at NIH, and also um, introduce some NCI program specifics. So. Um, I want to introduce the NCI SBIR Development Center. We're a development center uh, that has two teams that are separated on technology area, each team consisting of about five program directors. And these program directors have a portfolio um, that consists only of small businesses. They do not have academic grants on their portfolio. In our development center, um, we, we strictly manage the SBIR and STTR programs uh, for NCI, and we um, try to support the small businesses in our program and also conduct outreach and um, applicant support for people who are interested in applying to the program. So um, this was touched on by both Lily and Chris, uh, SBIR grants versus contracts. And I just want to mention there are some key differences. NCI funds quite a few R&D contracts as opposed to grants. Uh, you can see on the bottom of the slide, uh, the Development Center was formed in 2007 and since that time we've really increased our usage of SBIR, of R&D contracts, rather, uh, as opposed to grants. And um, we hover now right around 30% of our budget goes to uh, R&D contracts, and that is around 30 to $40 million annually. Um, there are, the key differences between grants and contracts is uh, partially that the R&D contracts are narrowly defined by the NIH. So as opposed to the omnibus solicitation uh, that's investigator-initiated and you can come in with your own idea, we define the topic. 
Uh, we at NCI try to have a broad range of topics, but they can be very narrowly defined, such as companion diagnostics for immunotherapy is, is a topic we've solicited in the past, <clears throat> as well as radiation mitigators and mono, uh, um, sensitizers, excuse me, uh, for radiation therapy. So things along that nature. We have, those are um, announced only once per year in August, and the receipt date is usually in October. Uh, there's a lot of reporting associated with our, uh, and R&D contracts, uh, so look for that program announcement if it's, you think it's something that you're interested in. I want to highlight a few of um, the uh, of our participants in the program just to give you a sense for what uh, who uses the program and why they've chosen to use it. So Lori Hazelhurst is an NCI awardee. With she's a co-founder of Modulated Modulation Therapeutics. Modulation focuses on novel mechanisms to target cell adhesion molecules. Uh, that are critical for mediating drug resistance. So Lori is a professor at West Virginia University. Her laboratory was making advances uh, that she really wanted to help transition into commercial and clinical availability, and that was really difficult to do with the R01 funding mechanism. And so Lori spun out a company and pursued SBIR and STTR funding through NCI. Aruna Gambir is another one of our uh, awardees. Aruna has a background in um, high tech industry. She worked in, in large industry and also um, in some small startups. She uh, saw a need in the immunotherapy community for tools to uh, assess early responses to immunotherapy. Her and her co-founders started Cell Site Technologies. Um, they started it and, and sought phase one funding for their feasibility studies and, and phase two funding uh, for further development. Sorry, my slide is taking a minute. And um, this slide, I want, this is probably one of the most important uh, slides in my talk. So we heard this from Heather initially in, in the introduction that women uh, sometimes have a lower resubmission rate than their male counterparts. And uh, Mary Podesek, who co-founded Symphotech, which is a company, company uh, that sells software to uh, simulate laser intervention or interactions rather with um, nonlinear or live material. So when talking with Mary, she really highlighted the need to be prepared to resubmit uh, by saying the reviewers are not concerned about feelings, but take the criticism seriously, correct the things that need correcting, and be prepared to resubmit. Don't give up because of a depressing review. This is really critical. Um, the FY14 success rate for uh, phase one grants in the S NCI SBIR program was 14%. That includes uh, first-time submissions and it includes resubmissions. And the first-time submissions are generally, it can fall well below 10%. So be prepared the first time you submit, um, you, you know, be prepared to get the reviewer comments, contact your program officer, that's what we're here um, to talk to you about. So contact your program office, talk about the review, and, and don't be um, put off by the fact that you need to resubmit your application. Once funded and brought into the NIH pipeline, the SBIR, STTR program, uh, there, the NIH offers more than money, and, and Chris talked a lot about this uh, in NHLBI's portion. So the NIH, NIH offers technical assistance to programs that are offered at the NIH level, so they are open to SBIR awardees from all in, to all institutes and centers, is uh, niche and cap. So niche is uh, a market research information really to help you develop a commercialization plan that will be required for a phase two application. So this is for phase one applicants. And CAP is really an individualized uh, commercialization help offered to phase two awardees. Another uh, training program that we have here at, at NIH that's relatively new is i -Core. It's an entrepreneurial immersion course. It's currently available only to phase one awardees. We had a pilot cohort in 2014, and we've um, since picked it up. Our second cohort's getting ready to start uh, in March. And the approach here is really just multi-stakeholder engagement. We're using um, the, the same hypothesis, experiment, design, test sort of cycle um, that all scientists are used to, but it forces you to get out of the building and talk to customers and talk to pot potential stakeholders. Our pilot cohort of 19 teams conducted over 2,100 interviews as part of their 10-week course. 
And so um, this is a, a pretty intense course, uh, but um, people report a, a lot of knowledge gained in key areas for commercialization. Uh, and I'm not going to go through this slide because I think we're just about out of time, but just uh, medical reimbursement, regulatory strategy, uh, preclinical development, clinical trials, and intellectual property are all areas where our pilot cohort reported uh, gaining knowledge. Finally, I want to introduce uh, NCISBI, our investor forums. Uh, Chris talked about uh, partnering with uh, various showcases and meetings around the country, and, and NCI is part of that. We also host our own investor forum where uh, we select companies out of our portfolio. We bring together a select group of investors and strategic partners that are interested in, in funding or partnering for, uh, with cancer technologies. We review your investment pitch and um, we bring you together with those uh, investors and strategic partners, hoping to facilitate relationships that are going to move your technology uh, off of federal funds because we're not going to most likely take you all the way to commercialization but, and move you uh, to funding sources that can help you take your technology all the way to, to commercialization. Finally, a uh, workshop NCI offers uh, that's restricted to NCI portfolio companies is the Federal Resources to Accelerate Commercialization. We bring together experts from FDA, from Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, USPTO, and also we set up one-on-ones with your program director, and um, we have a two-day event that we host here at our NCI facility in Maryland. We're getting ready to um, have another event in May 2016, and I flew through my talk um, to, try to, to try to make up some time, but here uh, is our website where you can find out more information, anything I talked about, also specific funding opportunities. I didn't talk about any of our, um, our, our technology-specific grant opportunities. You can also find out more about i our investor events, and importantly, there's contact information on our website for any of the program staff uh, that's in the SBIR Development Center. So with that, I'm going to send it back to Monique. Hello everyone, we have been gathering your questions and the panelists have agreed to stay on a bit longer to get through some of these questions. Um, please do um, stay on if you'd like and if not, um, please also remember to fill out the evaluation form. Our first question uh, goes to uh, Lily. Uh, is there a um, WSB designation um, and is it ever used in criteria for grant evaluations or awards? Um, the designation is primarily used by, um, um, for tracking purposes for the NIH um, uh, and the award, uh, the SBIR and its TTR awards are reviewed on their scientific merit, um, so the designation doesn't come into the review piece of it. How does one obtain the designation? I will send that to you, NHLBI. Um, so the designation is a self-designation process, and it is something that you uh, submit through the Small Business Administration at the time that you register your business with the SBA. Okay. What are the specific criteria for feasibility for Phase 1? So this can is Chris at the National FBI. Um, That's I, right. I can, does somebody else want to take it? No, Chris, go ahead. Okay. So there is no specific definition that we're going to use for uh, feasibility. This is just you need to determine sort of what is that killer experiment that's going to help you decide uh, sort of a go-no-go -no -go stage gate to continue the development of your technology. So if you are developing a new therapeutic modality and you have, let's say, 5 to 15 lead compounds that you've developed through medicinal chemistry in your lab and you want to run a, a small animal study or a, a more detailed set of orthogonal um, in vitro tests, then that might be a feasibility study to narrow down your lease to one compound that you're going to continue to develop. There are many other examples. It's completely dependent upon the technology. Can I add something? Um, so at, at NCI, this is Corey from NCI, and 
Um, you can send your specific games if you have questions uh, about whether you're proposing the right types of experiments or not. You can send your specific aims uh, either to one of the program directors listed on our website or, or to our main inbox, and someone can look at them. We ask that you send them at least a month ahead of time, otherwise we don't guarantee a response. But I believe uh, other institutes also do this, and I know Lily stressed the importance of contacting uh, the program early, and, and that's the exact type of feedback you can get from the program. Yes, correct, uh, and, and we do the same thing here at NCAT. As do we at an HLBI. Okay. This question is for NCI. Can you please discuss navigating conflicts of interest and commitment for faculty trying to start a small business? If there is an academician who, who also has a company, how can they navigate that and apply to the program? So the S, I'm not 100% sure that I understand the question, but the STTR program um, is specifically designed for faculty that are interested in spinning out companies. And um, as Lily talked about in her talk, the requirement there, there's, there's, no, um, there's, there's no employment requirement for the PI on that project. They have to dedicate 10% of their time, but they can maintain employment uh, with their institution. There, the small business does need someone that is employed by the small business that's going to carry out the work. So it, frequently what we see in STTRs is maybe a postdoc or a scientist in the lab will leave the academic setting and work at the company. So hopefully I've answered the question. I'm not 100% sure that that's what they've asked. So. And, and Corey, this is Lily. I'm going to add that it's always best to check with your institution about their specific policies around investigators. Um, uh, getting involved with SBIR companies, whether it means spinning out versus participating as a co-PI, because each institution does have their own policies on this. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, there are a series of questions uh, around whether a small business needs to have a physical address. Uh, sometimes startups are starting out at someone's home, and also whether they need to have a physical wet bench space for the small business. So um, go ahead, Lily. I was just going to say that, it, you know, um, I think that we would want to see um, a, a place of business recognizing that there are some projects that, you know, if you're doing software development that, that you don't need like a wet lab space for that. But I think um, at least from NCAT's perspective, we would want to make sure that, you know, um, that it is um, very much of a, a, a that there is a business around whatever it is you're proposing, but do you need wet lab space for everything? Um, no, but then remember that you have all these limitations around how much you can outsource with these grants as well, too, so you need to keep that in mind. Corey, you want one to add thing, else? Yeah, one thing we see somewhat frequently uh, at NCI is if someone, so remember that you, you need space once the award is granted, you don't necessarily need space for the application process. And one um, thing we see frequently at NCI is that people will have a, a lease from, say, an incubator that basically, or a, a promise letter from an incubator saying, if the award is funded, then we will provide space and these are the facilities that will, and the equipment that is uh, also included in that space. So if you're very, very early and you're concerned about you know, a, a lease for the application process, just know that, that there is uh, that mechanism and you should contact the program before you apply. This question is for NHLBI. How are the review panels put together in terms of reviewing applications? And a second part to that question, um, how can we get more industry and women-owned reviewers? Is there a process to make those suggestions? So to find out more about how the review process works, I want to encourage our audience to go on to the Center for Scientific Reviews website. They have a number of excellent uh, videos that talk about how the process works. Uh, most of the applications that come in to the NIH are reviewed at the Center for Scientific Review, although occasionally if an institute puts out a solicitation that's very specific to them, they may choose to perform that review in-house. And the way that they would do that is they would just identify appropriately knowledgeable um, external parties and invite them to participate in the review. In terms of 
increasing the number of uh, women reviewers and uh, socially disadvantaged or um, economically disadvantaged reviewers that participate, you can certainly either reach out to the Center for Scientific Review if you feel like you're qualified to be a reviewer and share with them your resume and what you feel you'd be qualified for, or talk to a program official. And we can often provide your uh, contact information and suggestions about the types of panels that you would be useful, you know, more, most appropriate to sit in on to our uh, scientific review official colleagues, whether they're within our institutes or at the Center for Scientific Review. Right, and, and Chris, this is Lily. I actually think that there's a tab on the Center for Scientific Review website that says how to become a reviewer that you can go to to, to do all this as well, too. Okay. We will take uh, three more questions before we wrap up. If you're a minority-owned business with a woman owner, can you select both minority and woman-owned on the SBR application, or do you have to select one? And I'm going to send that to NCI. Um, I, I, I believe you can select both, uh, as long as you, you know, both are clear through, through SBA. Uh, this question is for Lily. If there is an animal facility located outside the country through paid services, am I still eligible for the SBIR application? Monique, you said out of the country. Is that what you said? I, that's I right. Yeah, okay. Yes, out of country. Right, right. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, there would have to be a very compelling scientific reason as to why using an animal facility outside of the U.S. Um, you know, perhaps they have a very unique animal model or, or something very unique. There, there has to be um, um, compo foreign components and SBIRs are looked at very, very closely because, again, you know, the focus of this program is around um, development of small businesses in the U.S. If you do collaborate with a foreign um, component or a collaborator, there has to be a, a compelling reason. Um, maybe that collaborator has access to uh, a rare disease uh, patients that, um, you know, in a particular part of the world. So that's going to look, get looked at very carefully. If it's just because, you know, you like working with collaborator XYZ, that might be a really hard thing for us to fund because, again, there has to be a very much of a compelling reason why to fund a foreign uh, collaborator or site under an SBIR. Okay. Last question is for uh, NHLBI. Are the NHLBI advisory experts available for free consulting? As long as your question or your technology is in with, within the NHLBI mission space, which is cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, and sleep disorder diseases, and uh, then yes, they are free of charge and we are available you know, all you need to do is reach out to us, submit a request through the web form, the link that I had on my slide deck. Excellent. Last question is for Lily. Um, how can we get in touch with our program managers? What's the best way to do that? Um, so um, you can, go, I think I gave a link to the uh, program um, officers in the respective institutes um, and they they would be able to get you to the right people also if you're looking at a specific funding announcement look at the contacts on that funding announcement because usually there's a scientific point of contact as well as a grants management point of contact for specific funding announcements as well okay. and also Lily um, I just want to make our audience aware if you submitted an application then you will have a summary statement and if you go into your ERA Commons account, on that summary statement, you will see the name of a specific program official. So if you received a summary statement with or without a fundable range score, you can reach out to that specific person, talk to them about your technology. Thanks, Chris. Thank you to everyone for joining this webinar. Um, there are program contacts that we have listed there. Uh, please do stay on and fill out the evaluation. We would very much appreciate your feedback. Thank you again.